Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It was just about sundown. Jesus, the apostles, are gathered in the upper room where there's been a, a Seder that's been prepared. And the disciples don't realize it, but it's the last one they're going to have with Jesus. And that he's bringing them a gift there, too. He's going to talk about giving his body and shedding his blood, and they're not going to understand it then yet. But later they do, and they realize what a gift he gave them. And they pass that gift all the way down to you and me. Monday, Thursday, Jesus starts his real passion when the sun goes down. And then through the night and into tomorrow, and tomorrow night we will commemorate that sacrifice of that gift as well. So welcome to all of you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come into your house this evening and we begin to realize once again the weight of this night and tomorrow. We realize that it's for our sake that Jesus does all these things and we don't deserve any of it. But we come this evening to give you thanks for the gift and for the sacrament that reminds us always that there was real body and real blood on a real cross. Grant us your grace, receive our worship, and hear it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Would you please rise and we will sing our opening hymn. <laughs>
And now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. On reaching the place, he withdrew about a stone's throw away and knelt down to pray. Then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Judas, one of the twelve, carried with the crowd armed with swords and clubs. Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Peter replied, Sir, I just as Peter was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter from across the courtyard and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord had spoken to him. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Surely I have been sinful from birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. If we claim we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are here. Let us therefore confess our sins together. Lord, Lord you have called me to be your disciple. Yet there are times that I have betrayed you like Judas. I have betrayed my loyalty to you in thought, word, and deed, buying into my own selfishness instead of genuine faithfulness. I have denied you like Peter, promising to stand firm until the end, but cracking under the pressure of false ideas, self-preservation, and poor lifestyle choices. Lord, I am your disciple, and I have not acted like it. Please forgive me, renew me, and fill my life with your Holy Spirit. Make us humble like Peter, so that we might be reinstated to serve you wholeheartedly, faithfully, and in such a way that we can finally be effective disciples of the gospel. I have good news for you this evening. God is merciful. Even before we were aware of our sin, he sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word and at the command and the promise of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now the Lord be with you. Would you pray with me as we pray the collect as you see it there? O Lord, in this wondrous sacrament, you have left us a remembrance of your passion. Grant that we may so receive the sacred mystery of your body and blood, that the fruits of your redemption may continually be manifest in us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit. You may be seated as we hear special music.
people said. Amen. We'll listen to the word of God. The Old Testament lesson for today comes from Exodus chapter 12 verses 21 through 30. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, go out uh, go out at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of your door frame and will pass over the doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the house of the Israelites in Egypt. Spare our homes then, when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, 
from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoners who sat in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was a loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would the congregation please rise and we'll sing our gospel hymn. The Gospel is according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. You may be seated. 
When evening came, Jesus was reclining with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. They were very sad and began to say one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand in the bowl with me is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would, have been better, it would have been better if he'd not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus answered him, It is as you say. Now while they were still eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body. Then, they, then he took the cup, And after giving thanks, he offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which has been poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you the truth. I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I will drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, what a night. Monday, Thursday. That first Passover was full of so many things, but there was one among you who would betray you, one among you who would not come to faith. Lord, allow us tonight to learn. Allow us to gain the opportunity that you have given to us to take advantage of the table of opportunity which is given to us tonight. Allow us to receive your presence We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As we get started tonight, I want to start with a a parable that's been around for a while, and you've probably all heard some version of this or not. Um, As it goes, there was a man in a small town where the rains came and it began to flood the town and began to rise up, and before you know it, he found himself surrounded by water on his front porch. And he was praying to the Lord, Lord, <clears throat> he was a, a zealous for the Lord, Lord, please help me, please save me. And sure enough, not long after that, the canoe came along with a couple guys in it and said, hey neighbor, water's getting tall, you better get in here. He said, no, no, it's going to be all right, the Lord's going to save me, you go ahead. And then we remember how this continues, the water's continued to rise to the point now where he's up on the second story porch and he's praying again. Lord, please save me. The waters are coming. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm in trouble. And sure enough, a motorboat starts motoring up. It says, hey, neighbor, you, you better get into the boat because the water's getting taller and the levees aren't going to hold much longer if they break. This is going to be bad for you. You'll die here. He said, no, no. The Lord's going to save me. It'll be okay. And then the boat went on. Now the levees broke, the waters rose, and he found himself literally all the way up swimming, getting on top of the chimney, which is about the only thing that was sticking out of the water at this point. And wouldn't you know, a helicopter came in hovering over the loudspeaker, and a guy comes down the rope and says, here, I'm come to, I've come to get you out. And he says, what do you say? No, the Lord's going to save me, right? And naturally, he drowns. So he ends up in heaven. And he finally gets an audience with the, with, the, with the Lord, and he says, Lord, why, why didn't you save me? To which the Lord smiles, shakes his head. Look, I'm glad that you know me, but how many opportunities did I need to send you? I sent you two boats and a helicopter. The opportunities were there. He didn't take them. As we come together tonight on this Monday, Thursday, the Lord has given us many opportunities to be saved, given many people opportunities to be saved. And then he's also given us opportunities to grow in faith. But have we really recognized all those opportunities? Have we seen them all? Could we point them out? Would we know if they came across our path? And as we come into it tonight, we come to Monday, Thursday, which is a night of many things. The night, of course, where Jesus gives us at the Last Supper really the, the, 
the Lord's Supper, which becomes, in essence, the table of opportunity. Now, there's a lot of things that are going on that are discussed at this table. As they're reclining together, Jesus teaches many things. Monday, the word command, new command I give you, love one another. And, of course, he washes the disciples' feet, and many other things are happening. But the one thing that kind of sticks out here like a sore thumb is the betrayal of Judas. And so as we come at it tonight, we want to know that we take an advantage of every opportunity the Lord has given us. We take a lesson from Judas tonight. So let's get into it. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me, Psalm 41.9. And it doesn't take long to realize already, as you read the text, Judas has already made up his mind. And what's fascinating to me is that he's probably sitting next to Jesus. He's literally on his left side and uh, <clears throat> in the place of honor, and John is on the other, Peter probably across the table. And he's already got those silver coins jingling around in there, sitting right next to Jesus. So 30 silver point coins, the, the price of a slave. But more interestingly, it probably came from the same coffers that buy the, the lambs for Passover. And there he is, the Lamb of God. And so it is, the scene is set, and Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And I want you to notice as we go through this tonight, that he gives every opportunity, many opportunities, one last-ditch effort to save Judas. But he doesn't force him. And each time Judas resists, carries on with his plan. And so they sit down, and the disciples, of course, they hear this, and they go, Surely not, not me, Lord. You're not talking about me. And I don't know if this is guilt or what. Did I do something? Did I, you ever feel this way? I must have done something. I forgot. I, I'm sorry if this happened. This is where the disciples are. They're thinking, I must have done something wrong. They're pl completely clueless as to the scene that's unfolding here, really, between Jesus and Judas, even though they're right there. And so <clears throat> they go one after the other. But later on, they would realize... In every account of Judas, every time his name is mentioned in the lists of the disciples, it was Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. And Iscariot, by the way, is a clue, because he was probably the only disciple from the Judea area. And who knows what that could have meant. And so we also have a, you know, a case, of, uh, other mentions, John chapter 12, he's considered a thief. There are other little clues. As they look back, they can see. Perhaps we've had our own experiences with feeling manipulated, where we think, uh, how did we miss that? We've we got all the clues there, and somehow we still missed it. Somehow the little voices, the instinctive things that are going on in the pits of our stomach are kicking in. They're show, showing the red flags, but we can't quite put our finger on it. I think that's where the disciples are. They can't quite put their finger on it. How have they missed it? But Jesus says, the one who dipped his hand in the bowl with me. And that bowl is significant. It's a Passover thing. You got the fruits and the, the nuts and the, the vinegar, and you dip your, your bread and your meat in there, and you would eat. And this is a, this is a strong fellowship thing, right? You, this is a communion thing almost, a close brother thing, something that only happens to those closest to Jesus. It's one of our own. And so the bitterness is kind of setting in for Jesus here. And as we look at it, it's beginning to unfold. And so we see this, this subtle thing that comes up, not I, Lord. Um, we see this lack of faith and, and Judas kind of unpack itself here. And there's that subtle difference, not I, Lord, truly not I. And then you have you come to, to, uh, uh, to Judas and I want you to see the difference. Surely not me, Rabbi. It's not Lord, it's not Savior, it's not Messiah, it's Rabbi. He's been demoted. And who knows why that is? We don't really know. We know something worldly was going on. We know that uh, he wanted more, but it's Rabbi. And Jude, you know, Nicodemus said uh, Rabbi in, Nicodemus, or in John, John 3 when they were talking before he understood who he was. And we see the enemies, the Pharisees, who ultimately condemn him, call him rabbi. Won't you teach your disciples to wash their hands? Rabbi is a demotion. He's just a teacher. He's just an earthly guy. But Jesus gives him an answer that is unique. 
In fact, it's the only answer that's recorded in Matthew 26. You can just imagine him looking right, right at him to his left. It is as you say. Now how the disciples missed this, I, you know, maybe they didn't want to catch it. Maybe it was too much to process. We don't know. But we see this unfold. And there is an interesting lesson in this first idea today, and that's the context in which the Lord's Supper is given. Is not, it's not given in, a, in an easy situation. It's not given under ideal conditions. It's given in the, in the context of a betrayer, a denier, cowards, ultimately of, of crowds that would just assume crucify Jesus, amongst a culture that doesn't fully understand its own Messiah, people that would, would rebel against him and condemn him to a cross, to a governor who would condemn a guy. All of these things, these are the conditions that the Lord's Supper is in. And I'm going to tell you tonight, you don't have to look far to realize our culture is in the same place. You don't have to look far at all. So we don't come to the Lord's Supper under ideal conditions. And that includes the kind of people that are coming to that table as well. These are not perfect men, the disciples. We are not perfect followers either. But we come to the Lord's table because it is the table of opportunity to receive all that God provides, ultimately Jesus himself. So let's carry forward. Take advantage of the table of opportunity. The one thing we have to ask is, are we taking advantage of the opportunities? Okay? Well, let's think about this just a moment. We each have the capacity to, to do things well for ourselves or the capacity to make things a lot worse for ourselves. And uh, I'll give you an example based on someone that I have met of a, a young man who is father of two children with his girlfriend. They get in a fight, it's going to court, and now he's out. And the judge realizes, by his mercy, realizes he's got some mental issues, and he's going to, uh, he's going to give him a break. He's going to try and see that he, see, give him an opportunity to turn this around. And so he, he says, you, you can't have any contact right now with those kids or with the, with the girlfriend. But here's what we, we want, to do, want to see. We want to see you get your, your meds right, see you get, your, get some counseling, get to, with the doctors to help with this so that you can stabilize your life, get a job, and eventually be a good father to these kids. And if you don't, well, we'll talk about that later. And so he goes away from the court, and he finds a, he finds a home uh, with a friend. He bums a a place over the garage of a friend's house, not particularly favoring the situation. He's kind of resenting the fact that some judge is telling him how to live his life and that he's uh, implying that he's not a good father somehow and that he doesn't love his kids somehow. And so he sort of he parks himself there, no motivation, can't get up in the morning, hasn't found a job, and sort of just lingers. Ends up back in court. Time clicks by next court day. The judge says, here's your last opportunity. And if you don't follow through, the next time you'll see your children will be three years from now. So something triggers in him, something changes in him, and he, for some reason, finds a way to find the motivation, gets to the doctor, gets his meds, and gets himself moving, gets up in the morning, gets himself active, finds a job, and eventually finds some stabilization in his life, thanks to the friend, partially, of the, the garage. Now we see in this particular case, this is, this is where we meet people. This is the kind of people that are out there that have these troubles. The truth is simple. We have the capacity to make things better, or we have the capacity to make things a whole lot worse. And one is triggered by one thing, one has a fuel from one thing, one has a fuel from another. The fuel of following God's word and and. and and doing the things that are healthy for us, that capacity comes from the Holy Spirit. We know this as Christians. On the other hand, there are those of us that are still sometimes influenced, like Peter in one case, who can be influenced more by the devil, and in the case of, of Judas, certainly by the devil, to do things that are much different, more destructive, more divisive. And then and they end up lost. The sin we imagine out there is still very much a part of what's going on. 
And we can't wait till conditions necessarily improve for the opportunity, do we? Because let's, let's face it, guys. We're always... There's, when, when are we not tired? Let me ask it that way. When are we not busy? When are we not always feeling the greatest in one form or another? When are we going to stop being afraid of things like COVID? When is going to be the opportune condition that we'll finally activate and take advantage of the opportunities? Because the Lord is pouring them out. That's his nature. He keeps giving us his chances, and he does so in a way that we can win if we act on those. The Holy Spirit can be active there, and we can grow in that. The Lord's table is available. God's word is available. Worship is available. It's crazy. Online is available, too. And for those that are shut in, I talked to a few today. They're so thankful for it because this is the best they can do. But they're making an effort. And so we, we have these opportunities. We want to take advantage of them, and they're there. We have all kinds of clues when we look at Judas, how he didn't do that. And if you look at those clues, I've, I've given you an outline. I think I've given you a few things, but I'm going to share them with you. Uh, you see how ultimately um, how this starts off. We have clues all the way back in John chapter 6 where we hear that you know, the crowds are listening to Jesus' sermon about bread. And boy, this is a hard teaching. And many of the people decide to leave. <clears throat> and he asks his disciples, you don't want to leave too, do you? And so it begins this process of sin, slowly like a leaking tire, if you will. And we see this is slowly developing, building, compounding in Judas. And we see in that moment in, in verses 64 and 70, for example, that Judas was known to Jesus already as a betrayer and that in, he was called a devil even amongst them already. So it was already beginning. He'd already kind of left Jesus at this point. Jesus knew. The disciples didn't catch on yet. They'd know later. Then you go to John chapter 12, 1 through 8, Judas complains. We've got the segment just before, uh, um, um, just before the, the, the Lord's Supper. And we see there where she, Jesus is anointed and the woman pours out perfume. And Judas is speaking up. What a waste. What a waste. We could have sold that for a year's wages and given it to the poor. Right. Except that John says he was a thief and he couldn't wait to steal it. He was bummed that he didn't get the chance. And so he criticizes, and in Matthew 26, of the earlier verses, if you go back and look at it, somehow he must have stirred up the other disciples to say the same thing. And I kind of wonder if he wasn't part of the problem when they would get fighting with one another. If he wasn't, you know, Satan entered into him, right? So he was doing Satan stuff, divide and conquer. Makes sense. It goes on. The next thing we see is in John chapter 13, as soon as Judas takes the bread. Jesus offers the bread. We hear it. Uh, he offers it to Ju Judas. It's amazing to me. He's sitting next to Jesus. Jesus offers the Lord's Supper to him. Satan enters into him. How many opportunities does the man need? And we say, wow, this is amazing. How has this happened? But gradually there is a, a building that's going on. There is a tearing down, if you will, that's going on for, for him. And Judas is on making a course of decisions that are going to his self-destruction. Now we think, oh, some might think, poor Judas. So unfair for Judas. He just got picked to lose. No, he didn't. That's a lie. <laughs> Judas had all the same opportunities the other disciples had. Eleven of them believed. What's not fair about it? If anything, you can see in the table at the opportunity that he had there, Jesus was giving a full court press, even warning him that we'd be better if you'd not been born. Don't do it. And he had all the opportunity to make a decision not to do this. But he saw the same miracles. He heard the same teachings, right? He participated as one of the two by two that were sent out and cast out demons. I'm sure for him that was fun. Uh, witnessed three resurrections and still, by the way, didn't believe. Remember Jesus' parable? Even if someone should rise from the dead, they won't believe him. Apparently Lazarus, or, uh, Judas is one of those. 
Then you carried, you carried one of the basketfuls of the feeding of the 5,000. He had the seat of honor on his left next to Jesus, right next to the Lord with his little bag. He should have, could have, in fact, repented. He could have said, Lord, this is what I've been up to. I'm sorry. And Jesus would have forgiven him there. But that is not his nature. That's not who he was. That's not where his heart was. And Jesus knew it. And so he, he, he uh, betrayed Jesus for 30 silver pieces. By the time we see him the next time, he's bringing soldiers to Jesus. That's it. Arrest. The Lord's table is the table of opportunity. Not just for, for those around us, but <clears throat> uh, for us too. Not just for Judas and the disciples, but for us too. And we don't want to, to miss this. Um, the Lord's table. You can, we come to the Lord's table as an opportunity to repent, to put aside the sins, to put aside the life, to know that we're receiving God's gifts. The imperfect people that we are are welcome to it. The people of God are welcome to it and being fed by that body and blood. Now I want you to note how it comes to us is significant. It comes to us first physically. You got the bread and wine. And that bread and wine are, are given to us. It's a physical aspect. God is the creator of matter. He's the creator of bodies that eat food. He is the one who creates bread and wine. It, 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 is, it is something that we can interact with. Uh, it is something that you look at and you see how... Uh, how interactive it becomes when you can tangibly touch and eat and smell the bread and wine. And you, you can see the same thing at Passover. You had a physical lamb that was slaughtered, blood that was painted over the door for a very spiritual uh, presence to come by and decide who's safe and who's not the Passover or not. And then you have Jesus, God in the flesh. He didn't die spiritually, he died physically. And God brought all that to the cross, and when he died on the cross, he bled, real blood. And he gave up real breath. And he gave up a real life and died there. And he was buried in a tangible, real tomb with rocks in the ground. So this is the physical side. You've got the physical side of the Lord's Supper, but the amazing thing comes to that physical bread and wine in the spiritual side of things. Because in the Word of God, something is infused there. Something is brought to there. And it's totally in alignment with God's, uh, God's Word that these things happen. And it elevates the Passover from a wilderness feast to something that comes from God, a heavenly feast. And suddenly you've got something more going on there. It's a mystery. You don't understand it. In John 6, of course, Jesus is the bread of heaven that's been provided for us. But that, that spiritual then changes what's going on with the physical. If you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, what we're looking forward to on Sunday, guys, is a physical resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead. He had pierced hands. They touched and they saw and they interacted with Jesus. And 1 Corinthians 15 is saying, guess what? You, you who are believers in Christ, those who know Jesus will rise from their graves as well. And you'll rise physically. And the old will be gone and the new, is, new will come. Those things that plague us here and make things so rotten and terrible will be wiped out. And so we can come to the table and eat. We can receive it just like 11 of those disciples did. Believing in the body and blood and know that we're getting something heavenly besides. We'll get literally the presence, the person of Jesus, the body and blood of our Savior. There's a lot going on in that gift. It's a huge, huge opportunity. So we drink and eat it as often as it's given, right? That's what we say as Lutherans. And so I would encourage you to do that. And so let's wrap this up for tonight. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Ephesians 5, 6. We hear this. And we see here the, op the, the Lord's Supper is the simplest place with bread and wine. But you take, a body and, uh, you take the word of God and suddenly the very molecules are, uh, are infused with, the, with the, the spiritual. And suddenly it's not simple anymore. And we see this here. Judas made some very simple but very bad choices that led to some huge spiritual implications, had huge spiritual implications. And maybe this is the lesson that I hope that we hear the most tonight. You see, the simplest of choices have within them the huge 
spiritual possibilities of, of growing us in Christ, of bringing us closer to Christ, to one another, or the decisions we make, the simplest choices, have opened us up to the whispers of, of Satan himself. One or the other. Which capacity, I cannot say. But the good news is, and this is what I want you to see, here it is, is how much our Lord comes for us. The most stubborn of us, sitting at his left in some cases, keeps trying. Doesn't care how far we've gone, he keeps trying. Right down to the last second. And that's how much he cares, it's how much he loves us. That's the opportunity he's giving us here to draw us to himself in <laughs> what looks so simple. But it isn't. May God bless us to receive this table of opportunity. May we take advantage of it tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Let us rise. And now lay the peace of God which goes beyond all of our human understanding. Guard and keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated, and as we bring forward our offerings, we will sing the offertory. Would you please rise as we prepare to receive the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. We thank you, Almighty Lord, that you are the God of all people, that you are not ashamed to be called our God, that you know us by name, that you keep the world in your hands. You have made us and called us to be united to you, to be your people on this earth. We thank you for all you have done in our midst, and we join with all your faithful people departed and present, and with all of heaven, as we lift up your name and sing. On the same night that he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, just do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
now the body and the blood of our Lord strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace and in his joy. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come and the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Amen.